Dr. Kinsey, you have a visitor, a reporter from the Tribune, Ms. Hawthorne. Yes, Mary, she called. Please show her in. Well, hello, Dr. Kinsey. Hello. Thank you for seeing me. I'm Mildred Hawthorne of the Indiana Tribune. Nice to see you. Would you like to have a seat? Sure, sure. Can Mary get you a cup of coffee? Oh, no, no, no. I'll be needing to take notes. Okay. As I said on the telephone, I'd like to speak with you about that wonderful article in the Time magazine. Um, last month. Oh, I see you've got a nice copy of it over on your on your desk. <laughs> yes, a couple of my colleagues brought that in. Just razzing me, I think. Oh, I should say not. I think they're proud to have your face on the cover of Time magazine, to say the least, for your nine-page work on your study. Well, I, as I say, sex does sell. <laughs> <laughs> I should say so. The article says over... 250,000 copies on your first book, Male Sex, and the publisher has already committed to the same number on your new book, Sexual Behavior of the Human Female. Well, as I said, sex sells, but I'm very pleased that the woman's book is creating such a stir. I, should, I, I don't think you should be at all surprised about that. But in fact, some of the findings are quite shocking. 50% of women involved in premarital sex, 13 engaged in homosexual experiences, and 26% of married women involved in adultery? Do you really believe those things to be true? Absolutely, Ms. Hawthorne. In fact, we may have undercounted some of those behaviors. 5,940 women interviewed for your study how in the world did you get women to open up on such subjects? Well, you may find it surprising, but once they learned that they and our researcher would remain completely anonymous, we couldn't keep them quiet. It seems <laughs> sex was on the mind of women almost as much as men. Perhaps just more vivid imagination. <laughs> well, actually, once word got out about our research, we were deluged with applicants waiting to be interviewed. I'm sure my readers would like to know more about that, but I want to ask you a question about a book you frequently refer to in your, your work, a book from 1904 called The Sexual Life by a Dr. Charles Malchow. How could such ancient history be of use to you now? Uh, Malchow's was quite a book. In fact, I have a copy of it right over there. You might want to read it. Tell me more about that. Charles Malchow was ahead of his time. He already knew what we learned early on when we interviewed women who were young at the turn of the century that they almost never heard of the word sex except in the concept of evil lust. He felt education would be beneficial to those women and to men, and so he wrote the book. So Malchow also found people willing to talk about sex? His book was different than, my, than mine. Mine is a sociological study of of how people behave. Malchow was a physician. His book was more physiological and psychological, but we did cover much of the same territory. Now, Malchow's also was a bestseller book like yours? Oh, hardly, hardly, Ms. Hawthorne. For his efforts, Malchow was prosecuted for obscenity. Obscenity? You mean like dirty pictures? How did that happen? Well, times were different in those days. It seems like the Puritans were still running the country. There was a federal law from the 1800s that banned the mailing of obscene materials called the Comstock Act, which was used against Malchow. It was named after a particularly zealous anti-smut man who spent years in the enforcement business. I think he's the guy that got Malchow. But how could this Comstock guy come up with a book like this for prosecution? Again, the Puritans. In those days, there were plenty of private watchdogs who were offended by sex and were anxious to keep sex under the covers, mm. so to speak. Mother, there's this word here I can't pronounce. Well, dear, spell it for me. C-O-P-U-L- Stop! What are you reading? This pamphlet I found. Oh, give me that thing! Where did you get this? It was on Father's desk. I think it came with today's mail. 
Oh, my word, Lucy. This is filth. <gasps> Have you been reading this? Uh, not much, well, Mother. Uh, just a little bit. Shame on you, young lady. <sighs> is this where you got the idea for that birds and bees project I saw you working on? No, Mother, that was a botany project on birds and bees. Well, get up to your room anyway. And wash your hands after handling this filth. John! John, get in here! What's the trouble, dear? What is the meaning of this smut, which Lucy said she found on your desk, and she's been reading it? It, it looks like an advertising flyer, Prudence, about, about a book from some, from some doctor in Minnesota, and it contains quite a bit of text from the book. It, it must have just come in the mail today. Well, it's advertising for a sex book. A filthy sex book. I just, just look at those chapter titles. Hmm, the, the copulative function, oh. the act of copulation. Yes, I, I suppose that would be about sex. Well, and it came into our house. Right where our darling daughter could read it. Oh, and she did read it. This is terrible. Well, this, this came from a doctor, and it was addressed to me as Dr. Morell, so it probably was not intended for anyone else to see. That doesn't matter. Someone else did see it. Our daughter. Oh, who knows what this could lead to. The next thing we know, she could be gambling. Or, or smoking, or, oh, I don't even want to think of what else. Now, now, Prudence, don't get so excited. Don't you now, now me, John Morrell. I'm taking this to Mr. Anthony Comstock. He'll know what to do about it. of you to come on such short notice. Well, as soon as I got your note, Prudence, I came immediately. What on earth is happening? Well, you remember my daughter Lucy, right? Oh, delightful, delightful girl, simply delightful. Well, yesterday she got her hands on an advertising pamphlet that was sent to my husband, but she began reading it and oh, it has ruined her for life, Gladys. It has just ruined her. Well, what was it advertising? A sex book. Oh, oh, oh. A filthy piece of <laughs> smut. Supposedly about sexual relations, but filled with the most oh, disgusting and lewd and, well, as a Christian woman, I just can't continue. Look at it for yourself. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You know, I cannot believe poor Lucy, poor innocent Lucy, being exposed to oh, oh, words such as this, indulation, coupling. Oh, oh. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to take it to Mr. Anthony Comstock. That's what I'm going to do about it. Well, just think. How many other young people have been exposed to these pages of sin and debauchery? I cannot bear to think of it. <laughs> I cannot bear it. But I will take this to my entire membership immediately. As president of the New York chapter of the National Society for Moral Decency, I will take this to its highest levels that so-called doctor and his foul ideas must be condemned, must be universally condemned. Oh, I'm so relieved to hear you say it, Gladys. I knew that I could count on you and your society to take a stand against this. I will keep you informed of my conversation with Mr. Comstock. Well, right is on our side, but we must remain vigilant, Prudence. We must all remain vigilant against the evils of immoral lust. And we must continue to fight to keep the minds of our children unsullied by work such as this. <laughs> oh, 
Well, well, if it isn't Prudence Morell, what a surprise, and how is your excellent husband? Well, Dr. Morell is just fine, Mr. Comstock, but this is not a social call. No, no, I didn't expect that it was, but still, I'm always happy to meet one of my good friends again from the Vice Suppression Society. And that is exactly what brings me here, vice. And the worst kind of vice, obscenity. Well, as you are well aware, Mrs. Morell, obscenity has always been high on my enforcement agenda. I have been calling it a trap of immorality and a feeder of brothels, well, ever since my early days at the YMCA, uh, well, nearly 40 years ago. So what do you have for me today? This piece of filth. It slithered into our home through your U.S. mail and into the hands of my innocent daughter. Or perhaps now I must say my formerly innocent daughter. Now it appears this was mailed to your husband as a, a medical doctor, now is that correct? Well, that may be what the label says, but just look at those chapter titles. Well, I should think even a doctor would be offended by such language. Sexual sense? Sexual passion, the act of copulation, oh. copulation and propagation, nervous women. <laughs> well, yes, I do suppose there might be some rather, shall we say, uh, titillating chapters uh, in this book somewhere. Well, you can call it whatever you like, but it is filth, plain and simple. Well, the pamphlet does appear to be advertising a book written by a doctor and perhaps only intended for other doctors. Now, don't you think that might make a difference? No, I do not. As I have heard you say many times, neither content nor purpose matters. If there is any passages in the item that could be injurious to young minds, well, then that is enough for your law. Well, you are correct, uh, Mrs. Morell. That is the way I believe the law should be enforced. But here's another problem. The uh, pamphlet here appears to have been mailed from Minnesota. Now, it would be illegal to mail it here, but uh, presuming the book, the doctor, and the pamphlet are all in Minnesota, well, it would be necessary to take a trip to Minnesota to make a full examination. Well, so go to Minnesota. And any prosecution would have to be by the U.S. attorney in Minnesota, because that is where the crime occurred. But. <laughs> I have my doubts about Minnesota. <laughs> they have a bunch of Swedes out there <clears throat> and some free thinkers. Well, well, you know how loose those people are with sexual morality. Well, this sounds to me like you're eating cold feet. And it's not even cold out there yet. I want you to go to Minnesota. Well, and I'm going with you. But, but Dr. Morell, you oh, mean, oh, yeah. I have cousin who lives in Minneapolis, so I'm sure Dr. Morell will approve. And I feel I should tell you that I have also shown that pamphlet to Mrs. Gladys Forbes Hamilton, president of the New York chapter of the Society for Moral Decency. And she is repulsed by this pamphlet and has vowed to take a stand against it. Now will you go? Well, uh, well, why not? This does appear to be the type of thing we should be stomping out. Let's see if we can't put some starch in the shirts of those Midwesterners. There's a gentleman from the Postal Authority here to see you, a Mr. Comstock. And he has a woman with him, Mrs. John Morell. Fine. Send them right in, Barbara. Good afternoon, folks. I'm Charles Hopt. <laughs> well, so nice of you to see us, Mr. Hopt. Uh, I'm Special Agent Anthony Comstock of the United States Postal Service, and here with me from New York is Mrs. John Morell. Oh, Mrs. Morell is an officer of our Anti-Vice Society in New York. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Morell, and uh, I'm delighted to meet you, Mr. Comstock. 
there aren't many federal agents with laws named after them. Well, that is very kind of you, Mr. Hopton. I do appreciate it. But I never thought the law would actually carry my name. <laughs> it certainly does. The Comstock Act of 1873. As I recall, it mentions obscenity five different ways, but never bothers to define it. I suppose I uh, did make a bit of a pest of myself with Congress back in 73, so I guess they thought I earned the naming. And don't worry, Mr. Haupt, I can define obscenity for you just fine. I'm sure you can. Now, I imagine you all came here to Minnesota to discuss that doctor's book you mentioned in your letter. Oh, that is correct, sir. And Mrs. Morell has accompanied me from New York so that you can meet a real live victim of that book. Or, or, or should I say, the mother of a victim. Since it was her young daughter who was so gravely affected by an exposure to some of its filth. Actually, I've taken a pretty good look at the book already, Mr. Comstock. The, Dr. Malchow, the author, is on the Hamlin Medical School faculty in, here in St. Paul, and I invited him to drop a book off to me, and he did so last week. And I suppose he made some excuse as to why he wrote it. No, no excuse, and no attempt to deny total responsibility. In fact, he, he seems quite proud of the book. I, he's delighted that so many have been sold. 3,000, he said, the entire first printing, with 5,000 more on the way. <laughs> Mr. Haupt! My husband is a distinguished physician in New York, and I can assure you, he's never heard of this Hamline Medical School, or what is it, some playground for your frontier quacks? No, not at all, Mrs. Morell. Uh, although the medical school is rather new, Hamline University itself has been a well-regarded institution since before the Civil War. Their main campus is up here on Snelling Avenue, and I recommend you give it a visit before you leave. I'm sure Dr. Melchow would be more than happy to meet with you. I believe that Hamlin was established by a Methodist bishop, and I'm sure you'll find the campus very impressive. Mr. Haupt, I happen to be a Methodist, and I can assure you no Methodist bishop would find Dr. Melchow anything but utterly reprehensible and unqualified to teach at a Methodist university. Now, uh, Mrs. Morell is, uh, well, she feels very strongly about this, Mr. Hoff, now, as you can see, but it isn't the university that we're concerned with. And actually, it's not even Dr. Melchow, except for the fact that he is the named author of a book which at least contains passages of extreme obscenity, which were also quoted in the pamphlet that was mailed into Mrs. Morell's home. I mean, I mean, even the title of the book says it, The Sexual Life. Actually, Mr. Malcho, I have the book right here. And you are right about the main title. But what about the subtitle? A Scientific Treatise for the Advanced Students and the Professions. That doesn't sound much to me like an invitation to, for boys and girls to become corrupted? Perhaps you are not familiar with the judicial interpretations of the Comstock Act, Mr. Haupt. All that the law requires to prove obscenity is that some passage in the book may arouse lustful thoughts in the minds of the most susceptible victims, meaning, of course, young persons. Like my daughter, who was absolutely horrified when she saw that pamphlet. <laughs> I can assure you both that I am well aware of the judicial interpretations. This office has prosecuted several obscenity cases in the past 10 years, including one recent case where the offender got two years for writing a pamphlet on sexual functioning. But none of the cases has ever involved a distinguished physician as the author or a book which is considered a medical text. The law does not allow a pervert to hide his obscenity under the cover of something that may appear to be respectable. Now, you should know that. <laughs> Even so, Mr. Comstock, isn't the horse already out of the barn? I mean, thousands of books sold and even several thousands of pamphlets mailed throughout the country. This is not just one horse, Mr. Haupt. This is a veritable stampede that must be stopped now. <clears throat> I, uh, I can see that you're being a bit hesitant about helping us, Mr. Haupt, but before you turn us down, may I suggest 
that you touch base with your boss. My boss? Yes. The man at whose pleasure you serve. The President of the United oh, States. Oh, now, what makes you think President Roosevelt has the slightest interest in Dr. Malchow? President Roosevelt harbors very strong and, oh, and may I say, very negative feelings about obscenity. And he is a very strong supporter of my office's work. Uh, I do think that President Roosevelt would be very disappointed, perhaps even angry, to learn that obscenity is going unchallenged by his appointee here in Minnesota. <sighs> Mr. Comstock? I do not have the authority to indict the, the doctor, even if I wanted to. This is the federal system. Only our grand jury can indict the doctor. <laughs> but if your office feels that strongly about the book, I can certainly let the grand jury take a look at it. Uh, they may agree with you, but, but I can't guarantee they'll indict the doctor. You surely understand that. I understand, and I also trust that you will give instructions to the grand jury on the law that are consistent with our appellate court rulings. Do I have your commitment on that? You do. Uh, I'll let you know how things turn out, uh, but if they do indict, I will expect both of you back here as witnesses. Is that also understood? Very well. Uh, thank you for coming. Oh, and uh, be sure to say hello to the president for me. Thanks very much. But I don't suppose I got many votes from you prosecutors. Oh, we're an open-minded crowd. You know that. <laughs> open-minded indeed. Then what are you thinking about? Indicting a medical school professor with obscenity. Uh, the postal folks get pretty worked up about these cases, Fred. And so does, by the way, Judge Lochran. Just the last case that came through here for obscenity, the fellow got two years in Stillwater. Oh, I know that, Charlie, but for God's sakes, this book reads like a medical text. Yeah, more like a help-it-yourself manual, I'd say. And he mailed out thousands of brochures to homes. Still, I know. He's a local doc, and uh, we may be able to work something out for you. Like a dismissal? <laughs> That's not in the cards. <laughs> But I think we can keep your boy out of prison if he's willing to give up the book business. All rise. We can talk. This court is now in session. The Honorable William Lochran presiding. You may be seated. The clerk will call the case. This is District Court file number 3373. United States versus Charles W. Melchow. Representing the government is United States Attorney Charles Haupt, and for the defendant is Frederick Brown. The parties are present, Your Honor. Good morning, Counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Is that Mr. Melchow with you, Mr. Brown? <coughs> it's Dr. Melchow, Your Honor, and yes, this is Dr. Melchow with me in court. Ah, and are you and Mr. Malchow, prepared for a reading of the indictment, or do you waive the reading? Your Honor, we have seen the indictment, but we do not waive the reading. Very well. Mr. Clerk, please read the indictment. Uh, yes, Your Honor. The grand jurors of the United States of America do hereby, upon their oaths, present that the defendant, Charles W. Malchow, did cause to be deposited for delivery through the United States mail a certain pamphlet containing direction on obtaining from said defendant a certain obscene, lewd, and lascivious book titled The Sexual Life, both being in violation of U.S. Statute Section 1901, 
known as the Comstock Act of 1873. Mr. Brown, is the defendant prepared to enter a plea to this indictment? Well, he is, Your Honor, but first we move to dismiss the indictment as a double charge in a single count. The indictment appears to accuse Dr. Malchow both of simply putting a pamphlet into the mail for distribution and also for simply offering a book to sell. That's two separate charges, Your Honor, in a single count. The government must be required to choose which conduct it wants to pursue. Mr. Hupp, <laughs> that's ridiculous, Your Honor. The gist of the indictment is built, plain and simple. The defendant did indeed place in the mail this, these books that, to, to push his garbage around the country. And the pamphlet clearly describes the intention of the book to be it distributed interstate. The only question in this entire trial is whether the content of the book and the pamphlet are considered obscene within the meaning of the Comstock Act. And, Your Honor, the government doesn't think that to be much of a question. I'm inclined to agree with you, Mr. Hupp, at least as to the gist of the indictment. Mr. Brown, do you wish to respond? Well, Your Honor, we stand by our argument on the deficiency of the indictment. But more importantly, Dr. Malchow and I strenuously disagree with counsel's opinion, apparent opinion, as to the meaning of obscenity. Well, if he's right, Your Honor, he'll have to scour the libraries of every medical school in the country. Save your arguments for trial, Mr. Brown. Your motion to dismiss the indictment is denied. Now, does your client wish to enter a plea to the indictment? He does, Your Honor. Dr. Malchow pleads not guilty. And that is not guilty as any client I've ever had the privilege to represent. The plea of not guilty will be entered into the record. But your editorial comment, Mr. Brown, is hereby stricken from the record. This case shall proceed to trial in the October calendar. Court is adjourned. All rise. Welcome to the land of fair and impartial justice, Doctor. Old Judge, Mal old Judge Lockhart up there, uh, you know, he was a hero in the Civil War. I think he still believes he's on a righteous mission of some sort. But just tell me, we do get a jury to decide this case, don't we? We get a jury, all right, 12 men, straight and true. But it's the judge who gives them the law, and that's where the battle's going to be. Well, we certainly have to win that, don't we? I mean, you said yourself, Mr. Brown, my book is for doctors, it's not for children. I have some ideas on how we might be able to get around the judge, but this is not going to be an easy case to win, so I must tell you something. A, a few minutes ago, Mr. Haupt mentioned the possibility of a plea agreement. Now, well, what would that mean? Well, what that would mean is that if you would agree that you violated the Comstock Act, then maybe the government would be willing to recommend no jail time. Oh, a fine and maybe a probation for a year or so but you'd have to give up the book. So what it means is I would have to admit that the sexual life is obscene. That would be the condition of guaranteeing no imprisonment. No, I will never do that. You know it's not obscene, I know it's not obscene. All of the doctors who reviewed the book for me know it's not obscene. Surely a jury has to listen to them. Oh, but Charles, I don't want you to go to jail. Money for a fine won't be a problem, we know that. And then you can get back, get back to life with with your patients and your students, and with me. But I can't plead guilty, Lydia. What would everyone think? Besides, I'm not guilty of anything. I'm innocent. Oh, of course you are, Charles. And everyone who really matters will always know that. This whole prosecution is just absurd. I couldn't agree with you more, Mrs. Malchow. But unfortunately, it's not the doctors who run this country or have, wear the wet, uh, black robes in the courtroom. I told the doctor, this is not going to be an easy case to win. Uh, but I'm certainly willing to give it my best effort, and I've won some tough ones before. I really believe we're going to win this. I mean, we have to win, don't we? I'm sorry, Lydia, but I will not plead guilty. Fine with me. Let's get ready for trial. sworn to hear the evidence in this case and deliver fair and impartial justice.
You'll now hear the opening statements of counsel, following which the evidence will be presented by sworn witness testimony. Mr. Hupp. Thank you, Your Honor. Gentlemen of the jury, you are here to consider the case of the United States of America, which I am proud to represent, versus Charles W. Malchow, the defendant in this case, represented by Mr. F. V. Brown. The defendant is charged with the, by the grand jury with, with, uh, with violating the federal law known as the Comstock Act. This law prohibits the use of using the U.S. mail to transport any book, pamphlet, picture, or advertisement, which may be considered, and I quote, obscene, lewd, lascivious, indecent, and immoral. I repeat, obscene, lewd, lascivious, and immoral. While all these words can be used to describe the evidence that the government will present to you, we will simply use the words obscene and obscenity throughout the course of this trial. The exact case concerns Mr. Malchow's conduct in the, trans in the authorship, publication, <coughs> transportation and advertisement of a book, The Sexual Life, preceded by an advertising pamphlet which gave descriptions of and excerpts from said book. Both the book and the pamphlet will be presented to you as the government's evidence. Yours will be the unpleasant but necessary task to view the salacious, malignant content of these publications. Explicit descriptions of male and female sexual activity, including highly immoral and unnatural conduct and depraved abuses of their own bodies. You will also learn of Mr. Malchow's conduct of delivering this obscene material allowed access to persons of a tender age with minds open to corrupt influence. And that, gentlemen, is an important aspect of this crime. Now, neither the pamphlet nor the book, which is the government's evidence, there will be no serious disagreement about these materials, there is an old Latin phrase which lawyers use, which seems particularly applicable to this evidence. <coughs> Res ipsa loquitur, which simply means the thing speaks for itself. You will view the offending pamphlet. You will view the offending book you will be asked by your government to conclude that these do indeed speak for themselves. They speak obscene, loud and clear. Therefore, Mr. Malcha must be found guilty of this crime. Race ipsa loquitur. Mr. Brown? There you are. <clears throat> Gentlemen of the jury, first I must bring to your attention an important fact which my learned adversary has been very careful to avoid. The gentleman whom he refers to as Mr. Malchow has not been known by that name for at least 10 years. To his many medical patients in Minneapolis, he is known as Dr. Malchow. And to the students at the medical school at Hamlin University in St. Paul, he is known as Professor Malchow. Now these are not simply honorific titles.
titles, they speak directly to who this man is, both in his medical practice and as an author of the book, which the government would have you believe is obscene. Now, you may be interested to hear that there's one point on which I can agree with Mr. Haupt, race ipsa loquitur, the book which Mr. Haupt has so colorfully and inaccurately described does indeed speak for itself, but it does not speak of obscenity. The evidence will prove that Dr. Malchai's book, written by one distinguished physician and intended for others, contains information on sexual functioning, which is important, uh, it is uh, uh, accurate, medically sound, and useful, intended to improve the health, the welfare, and the marital bliss of countless married couples who suffer from the absence of such information. Ignorance, ignorance is the cause of human suffering. Is Dr. Melchow's book obscene? Only if human happiness is obscene. At the end of this trial, gentlemen, you will be asked to return a verdict, a true statement. And that true statement shall be Dr. Melchow and his book are most definitely not guilty. Mr. Hupp, you may call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Government calls Anthony Comstock. Mr. Comstock, please put your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You may be seated, Mr. Comstock. Mr. Comstock, please describe your position and duties as an officer of the United States government. Since 1873, I have been a special agent of the United States Postal Service, responsible for the enforcement of certain laws regarding the use of the United States mails. One such law is United States Code Section 1901, which prohibits the use of the mail for fraudulent or immoral purposes. Specifically, it prohibits the use of the mail to distribute materials which would be deemed to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, indecent, or immoral. That's uh, quite a mouthful, Mr. Comstock. Uh, would you care to simplify that a bit? Of course I can. These terms refer to the type of materials which would cause to possibly corrupt or deprave the minds of individuals who would be open to such deprivation or corruption and into whose hands those materials may fall. In other words, materials that might arouse lustful thoughts in the minds of young persons. Are you familiar with the defendant in this case, Charles W. Malchow? Oh, indeed I am. That is Mr. Malchow sitting right there. I visited him in his office just last month. I wanted to have a discussion with him regarding a certain pamphlet which had come into my possession that advertised a certain book that listed him as the author. The title of the book was uh, <clears throat> The Sexual Life. Was Mr. Malchow willing to speak with you? Oh yes, very willing. He freely admitted that he was responsible for the pamphlet and that he was indeed the sole author of the book. He even gave me a copy of the book. He said that 3,000 copies of the book had already been sold, that another 5,000 were in production, and he even admitted that he had already distributed nearly 90,000 copies of the pamphlet. I now show to you Government's Exhibit A. Is this the envelope and the 24-page pamphlet that you had Dr. Malchow identify? Yes, indeed it is. And you will note that it contains a one-cent stamp and cancellation marks indicating mailing from Minneapolis, Minnesota on August 15, 1904. And how did this pamphlet come into your possession? This pamphlet was presented to me in my office in New York City by Mrs. John Morell. 
into whose home it had been distributed by the United States mail. Mrs. Morell told me that she had been presented the pamphlet by her young daughter, who had been gravely agitated by its contents. I now show to you Government's Exhibit B, a book titled The Sexual Life by Charles W. Malchow. Is this the very book, over 300 pages, that was given to you by Mr. Malchow at your September meeting? Yes, yes, it, indeed it is. And you will note that if you compare the table of contents in the book to that in the pamphlet, you will find them to be identical. Your Honor, the government offers into evidence ex exhibits marked A and B. No objection. Hearing no objection. Exhibits A and B are received. And now, Your Honor, the government will be designating various pages throughout these, these publications for the jury to view. But perhaps it might be useful at this point to read to the jury certain particularly offensive passages. Yes, I believe that would be helpful. But first, let me address those of you in the courtroom who have not been here. I have been warned that the government's evidence contains highly salacious, even contemptible matter, which you will likely have find very offensive. You may choose to step out during these readings. All right, Mr. Hupp, you may proceed. Mr. Comstock, we will start with Government Exhibit A, the pamphlet. Please read the quotes from the introduction of the defendant's book where the author reveals his intent to corrupt the minds of the young and the vulnerable by exposure to his obscenity. Objection, Your Honor, to the editorial remarks of the counsel. The book do indeed speak for themselves. They need no help from the twisted minds of the prosecutor and his witnesses. Overruled. You'll have ample opportunity to speak about this material yourself, Mr. Brown. And I will not tolerate personal attacks on persons in this courtroom. Mr. Comstock, you may proceed with your reading. Yes. These passages appear at pages 18 and 20 of the introduction. Civilization, religion, and social ethics forbid diversified sexual experience, and sternly decree that this must be strictly limited to the one with whom the marital relation has been assumed. Practically, and to the shame of society be it said, this is applicable more especially to women. To counteract as far as possible the baneful influences of current literature, and to call attention to a scientific truth, as well as to endeavor to throw a ray of light into what must be a deplorable obscurity, is the object of this publication. And now, Mr. Comstock, to demonstrate how the defendant wishes to share this so-called scientific truth with the young and vulnerable, please read from page 13 the outline of the chapter, The Act of Copulation. Yes. Copulation does appear to be rather a fascination of Mr. Malchow. The chapter headings will give you some idea of what is to come. This chapter is particularly illustrative. Orgasm, the aim and end. Physiology of act, always pleasurable when rightly done. How orgasm in women is produced. Nervous tension relieved by act. Oh, look, there is more here, and shall I go on? No, I think that's enough from the pamphlet. Thank you, Mr. Comstock. Let's turn now to the book itself. As you know, there are numerous, seemingly endless passages of lewd descriptions leading to the act of, shall we say, procreation. Please read from chapter 6, the act of copulation, page 122, and then chapter 8, Hygienic Sexual Relations, page 183. Yes, I uh, believe I can give you just a small sample of the filth that you will find strewn throughout this book. Um, yes, um, 
under suitable conditions and surroundings, the solicitation of favor is manifested by a mutual interchange of gentle caresses, <laughs> which gradually merge into suggestive acts that are reciprocal and progressive, and which elicit delightful anticipatory subjective sensations. During this time, the sexual organs become turgescent, and there is a state of erection which is accompanied by sexual excitement. <laughs> Upon individual movement depends to a great extent the hastening of the climax. And since the civilized female is usually slower in reaching an orgasm, the male should not exercise undue haste, but <clears throat> by curtailing motion await the opportune time for ejaculation. And uh, finally, Mr. Comstock, to share, lest anyone believe that the defendant is supporting an upstanding moral lifestyle, please read his account of the, of the life of a young person that what they might experience with their descent into utter sexual debasement, which the good doctor appears to be recommending. Yes. This is from his chapter on Hygienic Sexual Relations, page 147. In any large city may be found on the avenue, in the theater, or at the races, middle-aged women that attract more than a passing notice by their vivacious manner, independent air, stylish attire, and a graceful carriage. They rear no children and assume no cares or responsibilities that can possibly be shifted upon another and are bent only upon having a good time. Aside from generosity, <clears throat> these women possess no commendable or ennobling virtues, but an impartial observer will see that they continue to live year after year upon the fat of the land and often retain a freshness and well-preserved physique that is worthy thank of a you, better cause. Thank you, Mr. Comstock, for sharing with us this so-called scientific truth that, um, that the defendant wishes to contribute to our civilization. I have no further questions at this time. Your witness, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Comstock, uh, you are being uh, modest, are you not, sir, in referring to this law which you enforce simply as United States Code Section 1801. In fact, is not the law known as the Comstock Act of 1873, named after you as a principal proponent? Yes, it is true that I and a number of members of the Committee for the Suppression of Vice worked very hard to get that law passed, and I am very proud to have my name associated with that effort. Well, being an expert on the law then, Mr. Comstock, perhaps you would be so kind as to point out for us where within the Comstock Act there is any definition of either the word obscene or the word obscenity. There is no definition, Mr. Brown, because none was necessary. Obscenity was very well defined by a British court in 1868 as any matter that would tend to deprave or corrupt the minds of those who'd be susceptible to such immoral influences, meaning, of course, people of a tender age. A British court, you say, Mr. Comstock. Perhaps, sir, uh, are you aware that uh, for the last 130 years, the United States of America has been completely freed from all things well, British. Objection, Your Honor. Perhaps you believe, Mr. Comstock. Sustained. Perhaps Move you believe, on, Mr. Brown. Perhaps you believe that President Roosevelt needs to get permission from Good King Edward of England before he can proceed with his Panama Canal project. That's enough, Mr. Brown. Well, Mr. Comstock. Tell me this, sir. Do you assemble a panel of young men and young women to review material which you fear may cause them depravity and corruption? Or do you simply rely upon your own judgment based upon how such materials might have affected you as a young man? Oh, objection, Your Honor. The witness is asking the the, the counsel is asking the witness to invade the, the, the province of the jury. Sustained. And the jury is directed to disregard that question. Whether the defendant's publications are obscene 
will be for the jury alone to determine. Again, Mr. Brown, I'm directing you to restrict yourself to admissible questions. Very well, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Comstock, perhaps then we can turn to Dr. Malchow's book, Government Exhibit B, uh, from which you have been taking passages quite out of context, I may point out. I would like you to read from the preface to the book these lines which I have indicated. Sex is the central fact of life, and owing to the urgent necessity for enlightenment upon a subject that greatly affects, directly or indirectly, every member of society, prudery and mawkish modesty should be disregarded. When others do not intelligently discuss delicate matters regarded as peculiarly intimate, personal, and shameful, it becomes a part of the physician's duty to do so. Can you agree with me, Mr. Comstock, that that passage sounds entirely like a communication from one physician to others regarding patient care, and not at all like an inducement to young people to engage in depravity and corruption? Of course, that is what it sounds like, Mr. Brown. That is precisely why I refer to this book as a wolf in lamb's clothing. <laughs> a wolf, you say. Well, Mr. Comstock, are you aware, sir, that Dr. Malchow mailed thousands of those copies of that wolf out to physicians, but none to any young people. And in fact, that pamphlet which you received from Mrs. Morrow, Government Exhibit 1, was mailed not to Mrs. Morrow, not to Mrs. Morrow's daughter, but to her husband, Dr. John Morrow, a practicing physician in the state of New York. I only know, counsel, that the pamphlet arrived in the home of Mrs. Morrell, where it was readily available to her young daughter. One more thing, Mr. Comstock. I would like you to read to the jury Dr. Malchow's dedication of his book, which appears right in the front. To my mother. <laughs> to my mother. Marie Gorecki Malchow, to whom I owe most of whatever I may be, whose physical deformity inspires gentleness, and whose simple true life will ever command my highest esteem, this volume is most reverentially dedicated by the author. Now, Mr. Comstock, in your 30 years of chasing obscenity, have you ever before come across an obscene work dedicated by the author to his mother? Not that I can think of at the moment, no. Indeed. No more wet questions for this witness. Thank you for your service to our country, Mr. Comstock. You may step down. <clears throat> Mr. Hupp, call your next witness. The government calls Mrs. Prudence Morell. <clears throat> Mrs. Morell, would you please place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I most certainly do. <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Morell. As I understand, you've come all the way from New York to be with us today, is that correct? Yes. Mr. Comstock asked me if I would come all the way out here to tell you people here today what one of your citizens did to my family. Are you referring to the receipt into your home of a certain advertising pamphlet Government's Exhibit A, which I now show to you. Oh, yes. If that is that piece of trash that I brought to Mr. Comstock in August. It is. Now, could you please tell us how this pamphlet came to your attention? Well, this is a painful memory, but I will do my best. It was a warm morning in mid-August. I was preparing for a luncheon with my women's group at our country club. When suddenly, my young daughter
daughter Lucy burst into the living room. She had a strange look on her face, and I could immediately tell that something was very wrong. Well, I asked her, what's the matter, dear? Perhaps she had been crying. She had that thing in her hand, and she said, uh, there are words in here I don't understand. So I asked her to spell the word in question for me, and she proceeded to spell the C word. The C word? Copulate. I'm sorry, Mrs. Morell. I don't think the court could hear you. Please repeat it. She was spelling the word copulate. And your reaction? Well, I was appalled. And then I was shocked to learn that that piece of trash had, had slithered into our home through the U.S. mail. Well, through my work with the Vice Suppression Society, I knew that I had to immediately report it to Mr. Comstock, as well as Mrs. Gladys Forbes Hamilton, president of the New York chapter of the National Society for Moral Decency. Well, she was equally repulsed by it. And can you tell us what effect this experience had upon your daughter? Well, Lucy is just 16 years old. She is as sweet and innocent and upright a young woman as could be hoped for. But she said she only saw a small part of the pamphlet, but she is young and impressionable, and, and who knows what damaged long-term effects reading such filth could have for her. Well, nevertheless, when I saw what she was reading, I took it from her and I advised her to wipe those words from her mind. She then proceeded to her room where she stayed for at least a week and didn't speak to me for at least that long. Anything further, Mrs. Morell? Only that whoever is responsible for such trash should burn <laughs> along with everything he's written. Your Honor, I move that this unseemly outburst be stricken from the record. In fact, I move that Mrs. Morrill's entire testimony be stricken from the record. Oh, Your Honor. It is irrelevant. I, it was based upon hearsay. There is no there. foundation, and it invades the province of the jury. The, the final remark will be stricken. But, gentlemen of the jury, you are directed to disregard Mrs. Morrell's opinion regarding the merits of the case. The balance of your objection is overruled. You may now examine the witness, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Morrill, may I assume that you have a long-time friendship with Mr. Comstock based upon the work you have done with him with his anti-vice society? Yes. Through my work with the society, I have brought many, many matters to Mr. Comstock for prosecution, such as oh, obscene nude sculptures in so-called art museums and, and those disgusting displays on the vaudeville stage. Uh, so can I assume then that you agree entirely with Mr. Comstock that if an offensive passage can be found within a, a, a document of any sort, then the entire publication violates the Comstock Act, regardless of how minor that offensive portion might be, and regardless of the overall merit of the rest of the publication. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. If there is any chance that the material can fall into the hands of young, impressionable people, then the entire thing is obscene. So that, of course, is why when Dr. Melchow's advertising flyer came into your home, this government exhibit number A, you immediately brought it to Mr. Comstock, is that correct? Yes. Uh, and that is also, ma'am, why you would never want any publication in your home which had any trace of obscenity in it whatsoever, is that correct? That is 100% correct. Now, Mrs. Morrow, you know that uh, Mr. Comstock has been reading excerpts from Dr. Malchow's book, which he regards as obscene to the jury. <clears throat> Would you find offensive, uh, ma'am, a story about two sisters who wished to copulate with their own father, who got him drunk for that purpose, who did copulate with him, became impregnated by him, and bore his children? That 
that is abhorrent. That is incest. And it's exactly the type of terrible behavior that leading, that could lead to, if you read that book. Well, and how about this story? Uh, a powerful employer who lusted after the wife of one of his employees, um, seduced the woman, copulated with her, impregnated her thereby, and then in order to keep her for himself, sent the employee off on a dangerous mission on which he was killed. Well, that is at least the sin of adultery. And that is just another example of the scene, obscene content in that book. And how about a, a man who uh, regularly masturbated oh. himself to the point of orgasm so that he would not have to copulate with a woman not of his own choosing? Mr. Brown, I think even you should know that self-abuse by young men is one of the most obnoxious and frequent and injurious results of obscenity. Uh, no, of course, Mrs. Morrill, but now let me share with you a copy of the book in which those stories actually appear. Do you recognize this book, Mrs. Morrill? The Holy Bible? Oh, objection, Your Honor! That is not, the Bible is not a, a, an exhibit of the, of the government exhibit. It, it, should, it, it should not be allowed in this courtroom. Your Honor, indeed, the, uh, the Bible is not a government exhibit, and so now we offer it as defense exhibit number one. Objection! Counsel is correct, Mr. Brown. The Bible is not relevant evidence in this case. So the objections are sustained, and your offer of exhibit number one is denied. Well, let me, for the record, Your Honor, state where these stories appear. Two of them appear in the book of Genesis, and the book story of King David and the lovely Bathsheba appear in the second book of Samuel. You've heard my ruling, Mr. Brown. Now move on. Uh, now, may I assume, now that you know where these stories which you regard as obscene are located, Mrs. Morrill, that you will promptly remove all copies of the Bible from your home, and you certainly will not allow your daughter to see this book until at least her 21st birthday. Is that Mr. true? Brown! And uh, further, uh, Mrs. Morrill, perhaps in the future, you will not refer to the first book of the Bible as Genesis, but rather as genitals. <laughs> Your Honor, I, one more word on this, Mr. Brown, and you shall be in contempt. I don't care if you're the Bar Association president. Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. I was only trying to help Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Morrill. And I have no further questions for her. You may step down, Mrs. Morrell. And I certainly hope that the rest of your visit in Minnesota is more pleasant than the treatment you just received from Mr. Brown. I most certainly hope so as well. Mr. Hupp, another witness? No, Your Honor. The government rests. Very well. We will now take a brief recess. All right. Well, Doctor, is the guilty plea sounding any better to you now? <clears throat> but you just destroyed their witnesses, didn't you? Yeah, and how could a jury possibly listen to a brood like her and a stiff-necked bureaucrat? Yeah. Surely these men have more sense than that. Unfortunately, Mrs. Malchow, juries have a bad habit of listening to the man in the black robe. And that's before he begins pontificating to them on the, on the law at, at the end of the trial. Yeah. And that's still down the road. Well, just wait until they hear from Dr. Erdman here. Charlie, can you believe what you're hearing from these folks? I'm hearing ignorance, doctor. It's like these people need enlightenment as much as our patients do. That's why you're here, doctor. You're up next. Be ready to take some heat. I'm ready. Charlie, you wouldn't plead guilty, would you? Admit that my book is obscene? I don't think I could, Doctor. I, I, I not if I want to continue helping our patients, I wouldn't. Prudence, you were wonderful. You are so courageous, Prudence. Oh, oh, but my dear, putting up with that horrible Mr. Brown that horrible brown and that terrible language that flooded from him through you to you and oh, how that went on. He should be disbarred. <laughs> and I am saying 
This was indecent harassment. Those stories about the Bible? Oh, Bible indeed. Well, at least it was just the Old Testament. <laughs> oh, it was so good of you to come all the way from New York to support me in my testimony. Hopefully this will all be over soon and we can get back to our lives. Oh, the I clerk is the returning, door. yes. All rise. You may be seated. Mr. Brown? The defense calls Dr. Charles Urton. <clears throat> Dr. Erdman, place your left hand in the Bible, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. The witness may be seated. Thank you, Judge. D Dr. Erdman, uh, are you a practicing physician here in the city of Minneapolis? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, for about the last ten, for ten years, ever since I graduated from the University of Minnesota Medical School. And have you maintained in any relationship to that august institution? Right. For uh, yes, for eight years, I've been an instructor. For the last four, I've been professor and chair of the anatomy department, the department that studies the functioning of the whole human body. Now, uh, doctor, are you familiar with the defendant in this case, Doctor Charles Melchow? Very familiar with Doctor Melchow. Uh, we both, of course, have practices in Minneapolis and are both uh, academics with uh, Dr. Melchow uh, teaching at Hamlin University's medical school, medical school and myself at the U of M. Are you also familiar with Dr. Melchow's book, Government Exhibit B, The Sexual Life? Yes, yes I am. I was able to uh, consult with Dr. Melchow on early manuscripts and even provided some edits on some of the drafts. Well, do you approve of it? That is, do you say, is you regard it as a valuable contribution to medical literature? Objection, <laughs> Dr. Erdman's opinion is irrelevant and the question is much too broad in scope. I agree as to the scope of the question. The objection is sustained. Well, Doctor, as a practicing physician, do you find that people entering the state of marriage are frequently ignorant of their proper conduct towards one another as it relates to their sexual functioning. Frequently Objection, irrelevant, immaterial, and incompetent. Incompetent! Well, doctor, let's try this. As a professor of anatomy, do you have the opinion that there is a body of scientific information regarding the human body and sexual functioning, which would be well to be known by anyone entering the state of marriage? Right, same yes, think, objections. And the same ruling. Your questions are much too broad, Mr. Brown. They should be confined to the publications at issue in this trial. Doctor, you indicated familiarity with uh, Dr. Malchow's book. Uh, in your opinion, would, it, would people entering the state of marriage be well off to be advised of all the information that's in that book? Right, I think again, same objections. It may be true that the book has some value to some people in some circumstances. But the issue, the only issue for the jury to consider is whether the material within the book and the pamphlet are offensive to the law. And that is a, that is a question of fact for the jury and not a proper subject for an expert opinion. Your point may be well taken, Mr. Hupp, but the government put the entire book into evidence. Perhaps the question should be focused on those passages which the government allege are obscene. Very well, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Erdman, you were present when Mr. Comstock was reading to the uh, jury sections regarding uh, the copulative function, were you not? I was. Well, as a professor of anatomy and as a physician, do you regard those passages as having been accurate? Objection. Yes. Accuracy is not the issue. Obscenity is. Sustained. Doctor, do you find that ignorance regarding sexual functioning is quite general? Yes. It is to be hoped that it is, Mr. Brown. And the objection is sustained. <laughs> Doctor, is the widespread ignorance on sexual functioning pre frequently contributing to ill health, M misery in marriage and other hand happy results? Objection again sustained. <laughs> Mr. Brown, why don't you try asking an admissible question? 
Dr. Erdman, do you believe that people entering the state of marriage would be well advised to be familiar with all the passages in Dr. Malachal's book, which have been read to you, plus anything else that the government might find offensive? Yes, I do. Counsel, I'm inclined to think that the only question is whether these and similar passages fall within the prohibition of the law against using the mail to distribute books and pamphlets which are obscene, lewd, lascivious, and indecent. It does not matter whether the book is accurate or has any beneficial potential. These things are simply irrelevant. Having said that, do you have any permissible questions for this witness? Your Honor, it has been our intention to prove through this witness that Dr. Malchow's book is not only accurate and medically sound, but also that it contributes to the health and welfare of countless patients and countless people who are patients of doctors who have access to that information. Moreover, the, ob the book obviously is not intended to be in fun offensive to anyone, and Your Honor, for all these reasons, we find this prosecution to be absurd. I believe that I have made myself quite clear on this subject, Mr. Brown. You've made your record and preserved your appeal. Now, do you have any additional evidence? Your Honor, we have several additional witnesses, medical experts, who we would like to put on the stand to make the same offers of proof as have been made through Dr. Erdman. And we would welcome an effort by the government to come up with one reputable physician who would disagree with them. I very much doubt that Mr. Hulp is interested in that offer, Mr. Brown. And I assume that he has no cross-examination for Dr. Erdman. <laughs> now, if I'm making a mistake as to one doctor, isn't that good enough for you as if it were done a dozen times? Very well, Your Honor. And although we strenuously object to and disagree with the court's rulings, the defense will now call its final witness, Dr. Charles Melchow. You may step down, Dr. Erdman. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Melchow, please place your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, I do. The witness will be seated. It's your turn, Doctor. You need not testify if you'd rather not, but would you like to explain to this jury what it is that you've written and why you did that? Yes, I certainly would. Well, okay, let's begin with an introduction. How old are you? Where do you live? And what do you do for a living? Okay, uh, I'm 39 years old. I live right here in Minneapolis, and for the past 10 years I've been working as a practicing physician, although for two years of that I was taking additional medical study in Europe. Uh, I've also been on the faculty for the past two years of the Hamlin University Medical Department, where I've been a teacher of proctology, uh, and I instruct uh, students in a clinical setting at various local hospitals. Hey, could you tell us a bit about your family, sir? Yes. Uh, of my birth family, I'm one of eight children, raised in northeast Minneapolis. I haven't been in a family condition myself because of my studies and my work until this past June when I married the lovely Lydia Glick, who's sitting behind you in the court today. Well, you're to be congratulated on that, Doctor. And isn't the name Glick a familiar one here in Minneapolis? Certainly is if you drink beer. <laughs> Lydia's family has been in the brewing business here for nearly 40 years. Now, Doctor, you mentioned a bit ago that you did some <coughs> medical studies in Europe. Uh, did those studies in any way influence, influence your medical practice or perhaps your writing? Absolutely. Uh, while in Europe, I became familiar with the writings of Dr. Havelik Ellis, who's the leading European writer on the subject of human sexuality. Dr. Ellis is currently publishing a multi-volume text on the psychology of, of sexuality, human sexuality. And uh, his writings opened my eyes to the unnecessary suffering caused by ignorance in that subject. And it was an inspiration, a big inspiration for my own writing. 
Now, in your own book, uh, Government Exhibit B, The Sexual Life, how long were you working on that before it was submitted for publication this past year? On and off for several years, uh, but a portion of an earlier draft of the book was actually published in a medical journal already a few years back. Well, prior to publication, did you submit your manuscript to any other experts for their review and input? Yes, I did. I provided copies of the manuscripts to various local doctors and academics for their review, and they were all unanimous in their approval of the book, and if I may say so, even their praise. Objection to the reference of opinions to others. That portion of the answer is non-responsive to the question and clearly constitutes hearsay. Sustained. Members of the jury, you must disregard any opinion of others on the merits of Exhibit B. <clears throat> well, Doctor, uh, prior to the distribution of your advertising flyer, did you seek any review of your materials for, by anyone for purposes other than medical merits? Yes, I did. Knowing that anything concerning the subject of sex can be controversial, and having some awareness of the concerns of the Postal Authority on the issue, I actually sought their approval before distributing anything through the mail. I wrote to the U.S. Postmaster General for a ruling on the issue, and I provided them a copy of my advertising pamphlet. Did you receive a response from the Postmaster General of the United States to that letter and request for review? Oh, yes, if you want to call it that. I received a letter dated April 29th from the first assistant postmaster general stating, we've received your mailing and you should check the postal laws and regulations that you can find at any local post office. <clears throat> Nothing in the letter from the assistant postmaster general about your publication being, let me see, obscene, lewd, lascivious, indecent, or immoral? Strangely enough, not a word. Doctor, I am now presenting to you defense exhibits numbers two and three. Are these copies of the correspondence which you exchanged with the Postmaster General? Yes, they are. Your Honor, we offer as defense exhibits two and three the copies of that correspondence. Objection, Your Honor, both to the exhibits themselves and to having the jury even consider this exchange of correspondence. The postal officials' opinions in about the nature of this material is no more relevant than the several doctors' opinions sought out by the defendant. The jury alone is to be the judge of whether this material is obscene. And therefore, any opinion sought out by the defendant in this matter is irrelevant and immaterial. Your objection to the testimony is not timely, Mr. Hupp, but your argument is sound. And so, therefore, the exhibits will not be received. Mr. Brown, once again, your exception is noted. Well, Dr. Melchel, perhaps we will be permitted to speak about your book itself. Why not? The book which Mr. Comstock claims was an effort on your part to lure young people into depravity and, uh, and uh, corruption. And you recall he read a specific passage from your uh, preface, which he claims was your suggestion that young people should use your book to self-educate themselves on sex. Perhaps you could find a passage in the same area giving the lie to that particular argument and instead stating the truth of your purpose in writing the book. Well, yes, my purpose, which I believe the book makes quite clear, is that it is intended to be a resource for physicians and perhaps other counselors in their duty to provide accurate and intelligent guidance to people on the subject of sexuality, especially people entering the state of marriage. If you just look at the book, page 9 of the preface sets it right out. In preventing unhappiness and disease in marriage, a heavy responsibility is imposed on the physician. An effort has been made to give only scientific, established facts, such as will be better to enable those who are consulted upon in these matters to impart rational information. Now, do you recall also Dr. Comstock, or Mr. Comstock, read from your book a passage in which he said was your suggestion that young women should engage in indulgence and dissipation? 
Yes, that is simply absurd. The passage he read merely illustrated the point I was making, that women can benefit both physically and emotionally from having a sexual satisfying relationship within their marriage. Doctor, uh, is a general theme in your book the fact that sexual ignorance or ignorance on sexual functioning is especially prevalent among women and that because of that it can cause misery in marriages to both men and women which can be remedied by education. That is certainly true. In fact, an entire chapter of the book is entitled Sexual Inequality. And that chapter finishes with the following paragraph. By the use of a little tact and intelligent consideration, any ordinary young wife would do her part in developing a sexual equality that could scarcely be disappointing and which would render her sexual relations very much to her own liking. More suffering is caused by ignorance of these matters than by all other causes. Doctor, is there anything else that you would like to share with this jury before I turn you over to Mr. Hupp? I truly hope that they understand ignorance in these areas is never a virtue no matter how important the people are who display such ignorance. Thank you, Doctor. Your witness, counsel. Mr. Hupp, you may examine Mr. Malchow. You testified of your recent marriage to the former Miss Glick. Is that your first? Yes, sir, and hopefully my last. So I can assume that you have no children. Yes, that is quite true. I can then assume that you did not bother to show your pamphlet or your book to young persons to review to determine its impact upon them. Of course not. So you have no idea what possible injury a young person might experience, such as Mrs. Morell's daughter, upon such exposure or to the extent that that exposure would surely arouse lustful thoughts. As you know, even you, Mr. Hopped, my book is intended only for physicians and other adult professionals. But the United States Post Office cannot assure that only they alone can see it. Is that not true, sir? I can only assume that the mail is opened in red only by those to whom it is addressed. Certainly, responsible parents would insist upon that. One more question, sir. Did you bother to follow the advice of the Postmaster General and review the postal regulations and laws before mailing out those 90,000 obscene uh, pamphlets? I don't know what obscene pamphlets you're referring to, Hopped, but I can tell you, I truly believed that asking the U.S. Postmaster General for a ruling would have satisfied any concerns. It certainly should have. Well, you were wrong about that, Doctor. No further questions, Your Honor? You may step down, Mr. Malchow. Mr. Brown? Any further witnesses? The defense rests, Your Honor. Stop. Nothing further from the government, Your Honor? Very well. Gentlemen of the jury, you will now hear closing remarks of the parties, following which I will provide instructions for you on the law. Mr. Brown? Gentlemen of the jury, you have heard from an investigator from the postal office from New York and a supposedly aggrieved woman from the same state who traveled all the way out here to Minnesota to accuse a distinguished physician of obscenity merely because he takes seriously his duty to his patients. Yes, Dr. Malchow's book involves human sexuality. The name of the book is The Sexual Life. But if you will look carefully at that entire publication, and review it carefully, not just the passages selected by the government to vindicate the accusers from New York. You will quickly come to two conclusions. The first is that Dr. Malchow's book is truly just intended for professionals 
so that they can improve the lives of their patients. Of course, there is explicit detail in there. It's quite necessary to overcome the widespread ignorance of sexual functioning, which causes so much misery in so many marriages. And the second conclusion is this. If by accident the book should fall into the hands of a young person, that person would be quickly lulled to sleep by the technical and academic and medical language which runs throughout. Thus, any likelihood of the book causing impure or immoral thoughts in young persons is so slender as to surely evade the definition of obscenity urged upon you by the New Yorkers. Gentlemen, this is the state of Minnesota. We pride ourselves in progressive attitudes on many different issues. That is the message that you should send home with these narrow-minded people from New York. People who can find obscenity even in the pages of the Holy Bible. Send them home with a message, gentlemen, of which you can be proud. A verdict of not guilty. Mr. Hupp. Gentlemen, perhaps you noticed a fairly relevant subject that Mr. Brown did not mention. The law. The oath you took at the beginning of this trial was not so you could promote the progressiveness of Minnesota or to send any message back to New York. Your oath requires you to apply the law to the conduct of the defendant for his putting in the mail sexually explicit material, material which clearly offends the law, against material deemed obscene, lewd, lascivious, indecent, and immoral. The nature of these passages have all of these effects upon them. And there can be no doubt in anyone's mind that these passages can certainly arouse lustful thoughts in the youth. 90,000 advertising brochures were placed in the mail by the defendant. Such careless and widespread distribution of this filth is precisely why Congress, what Congress sought to prohibit in the passing of this law. Listen carefully to your instructions from Judge Lochran. View as much of the lewd descriptions of sexual acts as you can tolerate. Then return with the only verdict that can justify the facts and the law. A verdict of guilty. Guilty as charged. Gentlemen of the jury, you will now be instructed on the law which is to guide your deliberations. First, as you've heard, defendant Malchow is charged by indictment with violating the federal law which prohibits the use of the mail for the delivery of matter deemed obscene, lewd, and lascivious. The only true issue in this case is whether the pamphlet and the underlying book written and mailed by the defendant qualify under the law as obscene. On that subject, you are instructed as follows. The marriage relation and the family relation based upon marriage, its home and the family of children growing up to manhood and chaste womanhood, are the basis of civilized society. The country wherein the men are not only industrious, but honorable, and the chastity of the women is universal, not only protected by the law but by the stern hands of male relatives. It is always a prosperous community, 
and a general laxity in the morals of women degrades an entire community. Therefore, it is for the public interest that morality should be conserved in its young of both sexes. The general sense of community is that everything obscene, lewd, and lascivious should be kept from the immature, particularly children and youth. Now it is for up to you to determine whether any portion of the book or pamphlet under consideration is obscene, lewd, and lascivious, or would be likely to raise libidious thoughts in the young and the immature. Such a book would be improper for any reasonable person to bring into his or her family. If from the whole evidence you find that the defendants are guilty of the offense charged, your verdict will so declare. If the evidence fails to satisfy you on each of these points, your verdict will be not guilty. Mr. Clerk, you may now take the jury out for their deliberation. All right. The jury will accompany me to the jury room. That judge just told the jury to find Charles guilty. I'm afraid you're right, Mrs. Malchow. I had hoped that he would leave some room in his instructions for an acquittal. He closed that door pretty tight. <laughs> what are you saying? The jury can't do that. Can't they make up their mind regardless of what that old fool told them? Oh, that's possible, Doctor, but it doesn't happen very often. Not when a verdict has been directed, essentially, by the judge, which is exactly what happened here. Charles, you just can't go to prison. Didn't help say that he would go along with probation. That was before the trial, Mrs. Malchow. Uh, we could ask again if the doctor wishes. Yes, he wishes. Don't you, Charles? Charlie, a minute, please. That was quite a charge the old man gave to the jury. Doesn't leave me with much hope. I warned you about him, Fred. The old soldier comes down hard on obscenity. And he certainly doesn't like being called ignorant. And I heard that there were some local politicians that were trying to bend his ear about this case. It seems a local beer baron uh, might have helped them out there. I got a few calls myself. I'm assuming you had nothing to do with that, Brown? Uh, father may have done that, Mr. Brown. He's been working so hard on President Roosevelt's re-election campaign. And maybe that's where he ran into some of those folks. But he certainly has the right to speak his mind, doesn't he? I knew nothing about that, Charlie, you know that. I would have told you if I had. I would have stopped it. Uh, anyway, any chance of a plea? Nah, nothing that's going to keep your boy out of jail, I'm afraid. Lochran, he won't even consider probation, even if I recommended it. No, that dog is dead. I'm guessing he'll get about two years, just like the last writer. Sorry, Brown. Nice try. How about the appeal, Mr. Brown? Well, Would that fix this? we'll bring it up to the Eighth Circuit, Doctor. We certainly have some issues to bring up, but the Eighth Circuit does not reverse jury verdicts very often. I think we might have a better chance if we could get a pardon. And if Mrs. Malchow's father truly does have those connections to the politicians. But they'd have to get to the president. You leave it to me, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Darling, don't you worry. Surely there are some intelligent folks in the government, more intelligent than what we've seen here. And I hear that the president's daughter, Alice, she is very supportive of anything that helps women. Perhaps I can get her attention. I'll try. Sex 
could be helpful in winning the women's right to vote. Oh, it's all part of the same thing, Alice. Men rule the world, men rule the bedroom. Men think that by keeping us in the dark, nothing will ever change. I think that if we can start with the bedroom, the rest will fall into place. Interesting theory. And I must say that book by your husband certainly says a lot of things that I never knew before. Next month I'm getting married right here in the White House, so I found that book particularly interesting. But I'm not sure what Papa would say if he knew that I'd been reading it. Well, I think he may already have seen it, Alice. A copy was sent to him by Senator Nelson, who also asked him to pardon my husband before he has to go to prison. Your note mentioned that your husband had been tried for, what, obscenity? And now he's supposed to go to jail just for writing that book? That's right. And the appellate court just denied his appeal. All men on the court, of course. And they think that we, women, shouldn't have access to that kind of information. Well, whatever happened to the First Amendment? I thought there was something in there about free speech. Apparently not, if it means that women might find out how to be equal partners in bed with their husbands. And I assume if your husband goes to jail for writing that book, there's not much chance that it will become widely known. Oh, exactly. That's why it's so important that your father pardon my Charles. Hmm. Well, Papa has been speaking to me more these days on important questions. Just last year, he sent me off to Asia as a goodwill ambassador for the administration. So just maybe I can get him to go along with Senator Nelson on this one. Oh, and it's not just Senator Nelson, Alice. Uh, Senator Clapp and Representative Fletcher, they also sent letters on Charles's behalf. And they are his fellow Republicans. Those votes are important to Papa. We have a midterm election coming up, and those Democrats would just love to grab more seats in Congress. So... You'll speak to him? Yes, I will. You've convinced me. Now, would you like another cup of tea? The news about uh, the doctor, Dr. Rauschow, will be very disappointing to the people back in Minnesota. You know that, Mr. President. You know, you know it's that uh, those beer boys, Mr. Glick and those, they, they've been very friendly to us in the past. What am I going to say to them if we want some more money for the party? Here's something. You tell them that I agree to stay clear of that temperance crowd. Oh, that will be good news to them. You know, those dry scare the hell out of the breweries. They scare the hell out of a lot of people. Yeah, I know that. Well, thank, thank you, you Mr. Senator. Mr. Yes. Good morning, Alice. Good morning, Papa. Who was your visitor? Oh, that was a nice lady from Minnesota. One of your strong supporters. Minnesota? That's all I'm hearing about recently. The mayor of Minneapolis visited me twice this week, and Senator Clapp just left. Well, this woman came to see me about a book that her husband has written. Not that sex book. Don't those people up there have anything else to think about? <laughs> Why, that's why the mayor was here and Senator Clapp. And look at this. I've got letters from both senators and the representative and the governor of Minnesota. They all want me to give a pardon to this, this Mel Chow, the so-called doctor that wrote that book. Nelson even sent me a copy. I think it's an important issue, Papa. And obviously, your political friends in Minnesota feel the same way. Ha! Huh. I can tell you what they're feeling, Alice. They're feeling the heat from a wealthy contributor. Some brewing big shot named Gluck. You must like dirty books. Oh, it's not a dirty book, Papa. It's more like a, a medical book. And a lot of it has to do with women and how they can be happier in marriage. Well, you want me to be happy, don't you, Papa? Alice, don't I have enough to worry about without worrying about authors of dirty books in Minnesota? The trusts keep fighting me. We've got terrible problems in Central America. And, and I just found out that I'm a candidate for the Nobel Prize for my work with solving the Russian-Chinese War. Now, wouldn't that Nobel Committee 
be fascinated to find out that I'm also a champion of dirty books. Well, I thought you were at least a champion of the Constitution, Papa. The Constitution? The First Amendment, Papa. Isn't speech supposed to be free? And aren't books speech? Alice, I've seen the book. I don't think that's the kind of speech our founders had in mind. Hell, that's too much for my Rough Riders back at the war. And those guys were pretty rough. Papa, I promised that lady you'd be fair. Well, that you'd at least consider a pardon for her husband, please. And I have considered it, Alice. As a matter of fact, I wrote my response to Senator Nelson just this morning. Here's a copy. I'm sorry, Alice. I can't give in to you on this one. Now. I've got a cabinet meeting where we're going to talk about problems that the whole world is concerned about. Dear Senator Nelson, I'm sorry to say that in the case of the doctor who's been convicted for circulating obscene literature, the more I've looked into it, the less I feel inclined to relieve the man in any way of the penalty of his crime. I very much doubt whether he ought not to serve out his full term in the penitentiary. It is a hideous and loathsome book. I would as soon see poison circulated in the household as see that book put therein. And it is to me simply inconceivable that it should have been written save for debased purposes and by a man of debased mind. It is a matter of real regret that I cannot take the lenient view which you and Senator Clapp and President Northrop and so many other good men urge me to take. Faithfully yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Hmm. So much for the First Amendment, I guess. So this Mountchow guy was prosecuted under something called the Comstock Act? Yes, that old law is still on the books. It bans the use of the mail for everything the government deems, uh, let me remember the words, um, obscene, lewd, lascivious, and indecent, as I recall. If it's the same law, your book covers the same subject, how come you're not in prison? Well, times have changed in the last 50 years, and so have court opinions about obscenity. In fact, I got a magazine in the mail just last week. Ooh. I'm going to show you. It's called Playboy, and it's published <laughs> by a guy by the name of Hefner up in Chicago. Gee, that's, that's Marilyn Monroe. Yes, and why don't you take a look at the picture in the middle? <laughs> Nineteen fifty-three, Miss Hawthorne. That's where the country is at. But what do you suppose that old smut hunter Comstock would have to say about that? Oh, I suppose he'd want you and this Hefner guy locked up. Yeah. Well, but what about poor old Doctor Malchow? Oh, it's too late to ask him. Malchow died quite a few years ago, but I believe his widow is still back in Minnesota. I actually interviewed her early on in our research, and she told me about poor Malcho dying after practicing medicine for a few years after he got out of prison. And she agreed to take one of our surveys on personal sexual habits. Oh, I'd love to see that one. Oh, no. Those surveys are kept in our vault strictly confidential. But I will tell you, she did smile before she answered a couple of those questions. <laughs> okay, all right, doctor. So now we're able to, and apparently able to write and distribute anything we want to about sex. Dirty pictures, or should I say nude ones, are all fair game. What should we think about all of this? You know, I, I really don't understand your question. Should this be considered progress? I mean, is there something for this Comstock's world, or... Or, in other words, were we better off when we kept sex out of the public's eye? Well, you're asking the wrong person, Miss Hawthorne. Me, I'm just a scientist. I just report on what people do. And Malchow 
did the same, except he reported how they did it in very physical terms. But is the world better off now? That's not for me to say. Well, then who can say? Well, I suppose you could take that question down the street to a couple of other departments. Philosophy, maybe, or religion. Those are the people that claim to know what's right and what's wrong. Or maybe you could ask the couples who have had access to our information. The Dr. Malchow and I made their lives better. Dr. Kinsey, that sounds like a good subject for another study. Perhaps even another best-selling book. Oh, I like that idea. The Personal Sexual Habits of the Modern Educated Woman. See, I have a few forms here. Would you consider being part of our next thousand subjects? <laughs>